All right. As I mentioned in announcements, I'm, um, I've shifted a little bit the sermon order in which I was, I was preparing to do the Bible study this morning, of course. But um, I felt this is more important to preach this morning. Uh, and we have to do this from time to time in general, just w- with a lot of different things in Scripture, right? There's a lot of areas of our life where um, we, we generally know maybe what we're supposed to be doing. We kind of know some things. We end up getting a little sloppy or kind of get relaxed in certain areas spiritually. So we need to uh, just revisit them and address them. And this morning, the, the specific topic I want to focus on improving is our soul winning. Okay, our soul winning. And, and again, if you're here and you're not familiar with that term, you don't know what that means. Uh, we have that announcement where we try to keep track of, of people that we lead to Christ. Soul winning is winning a soul to Christ. And, and when we win a soul, it's we're going out to try to convince people, to persuade them, to put their trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Right? That's, that's our mission. That's our objective. And that's something that Jesus Christ commanded. Right? At, the, at the end of the Gospels, you'll see this called the Great Commission, where he commands people to go forth into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that's, that is incumbent upon every single person who already is a believer to do that work. Everybody. Man, woman, boy, girl, this is our, look, if you're saved, you have now a duty, you have a responsibility to go forward and preach the gospel and tell other people how to be saved. And, and that's how all of us have been saved. It's through the work of other people who have shared that same truth, that same message from the word of God. No one here is saved this morning without having heard the truth from somebody else, without somebody sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. Faith cometh by hearing, the Bible says, and hearing by the word of God. So we all that are saved had to have heard the gospel from somebody at some point, and it had to come from the word of God in order to get saved. I mean, it's literally what the Bible teaches. So we all have that, and it's incumbent upon us to do so. So when I talk about soul winning, that's what I'm talking about, is that us going out, being sent out as Jesus sent out his disciples, two and two, to preach the gospel. We do the same thing here in this church, and this is the most important thing that a Christian can be doing with their time, and it's something that isn't just a good suggestion. It's not just, oh, what's the best thing I could do? It's, it's a commandment. Okay, this is something that, that has been committed unto you as a believer from the Lord, from God. Look down there in verse number 17. The Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. So just pausing right there. When you get saved, you are born again. You become a new creature. And come back tonight, 1 John chapter 3, we're going to go really in depth on this subject of the new man, a new birth, a new creature, because that's really contained a lot in 1 John chapter 3. But when you're born again, there is a new creature that's born again inside of you, which is different than the old man. It's different than who you have been your whole life until the moment of salvation. That new creature, that new man is born of God and that's why you can be called a child of God is because you were born again. And clearly the world and the ways of the world are different than God and the ways of God. The things of the Father and the things of the world are not the same. So before someone's saved, you're living in the world, you're of the world, you do the things of the world because you have that natural man. It makes sense. It's just, it's part of who we are as human beings naturally in this flesh. But when you get saved, look, there's now there's a new creature. Now there's a new birth. Now, behold, all things have become new. And because they, all things have become new, you, you, there's going to be things that are expected of you as a new creature that God is going to require of you to do through that spiritual man that, that as a child of God. Now, look, you are part of God's family. Now, you have different expectations that are laid upon you and, and different um, you know, life that you need to live according to the word of God. So the Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So before we continue this, this word reconcile comes up quite a few times in this passage. 
We need to be reconciled to God. And what that means is that we have a problem with God as being a sinner, right? So we're on bad terms with God as, human, as sinners, as human beings, because we break his laws, we break his commandments, therefore we deserve to be punished for our sins. And the ultimate punishment, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. We deserve that death penalty. We deserve the, the, the penalty of hell for our sins. So this is a problem. We need to be reconciled. We need to get things right with God. As a sinner, though, the only way you get things right with God is through Jesus Christ because once you've already broken the law, you've broken the commandments, there's no making up for that. There's nothing else that you can do. You can't do a whole bunch of good works to try to make up for what you've done that's bad. And as I'd like to mention to people, especially when we go out soul winning, you know, when you do good, you're just meeting the minimum requirement anyways. <laughs> like you're, not, you're not doing extra. Every time you do good, you are, you are meeting the minimum. You are not going above and beyond. When you do good, the Bible says, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So you think, oh, I'm going to do all this good stuff to pay for my sins. No. If you know you're supposed to do good and you don't do it, it's a sin. So, so when you say, hey, I'm going to do all this good stuff, great, you're, you've met the commandment. You've met the minimum. You, you're not paying for anything that you've done. Which is why we need, hey, we, we owe a debt. We've sinned. We need someone to now erase that debt for us, to pay that debt for us, and thank God Jesus Christ did that for us. And that is how we are reconciled to the Father. We're made right through the blood of Jesus Christ, through what he did for us. Now, whereas we had this problem as a sinner, we had this, this, this debt of sin that we owed. Hey, he paid that debt for us, so great. Now we're back in good standing with God because we're saved, because we're born again, because Christ paid everything for us. So he reconciled us to God. Jesus did. But look, it also says in, at the end of verse 18, and he's given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Right. Verse 19, we'll, we'll explain, expound further on this, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Right? So when Christ was physically, literally walking around on this earth, right, he was preaching the gospel. Amen. God with Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Because that's what it means to be saved, by the way, is that your, your sins and your trespasses now are no longer going to be imputed unto you. It means you're not going to be held responsible for those because Christ has already made the payment. You're washed clean of those trespasses. But then it says this, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So Jesus was doing this when he was on, his, on the world, but then he also did this while he was on his earth, was committing unto us this word of reconciliation. And of course, he sent out his disciples. He sent people out to preach the gospel and said, hey, look, this is your job. I want you doing this. It wasn't just him doing that. Verse 20 says this, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So Jesus Christ lived, he died on the cross, he rose again from the dead, he ascended up into heaven. Okay, and that's where he is now, sitting on the right hand of God the Father. He is no longer personally, individually talking to people to get them saved as he did when he was alive on this earth, physically speaking, right? So because he's not here doing that, he has ambassadors. He has people to speak on his behalf in order to do this job. And that's what he says. Look, we're ambassadors for Christ. So Christ isn't here right now physically. Right? Spiritually, yeah, of course. We know he's God. He's everywhere. But, but physically speaking, carnally speaking, he's not here. So we're going to be his ambassadors. And what does an ambassador do you don't relay your own message. You don't talk about yourself. An ambassador literally is representative of somebody else. 
And I mean, this is the case in, in human governments. We have ambassadors from other countries that are here to express their interests for their country, for their government, for other people back home. And we have obviously ambassadors, U.S. ambassadors in other countries that are there to express the interest of someone else, not just themselves. It's for, they're there for someone else. They're representing someone else. And when we, uh, as believers, We've been committed this job, this ministry, this ministering, this serving other people by representing Jesus Christ here on this earth and sharing with people how they can be reconciled to God, how their sins can be atoned and paid for. Look, tell them what Jesus did. We already know how we got saved. We need to tell other people how they can be saved too. We are ambassadors for Christ. Uh, verse number 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, with this in mind, as an ambassador for Christ, this is all, most of you have come into church for a while, you already know this, right? We talk about this often enough. This is the, the heart and soul of our church is going forth and do this. But I, I want you to internalize and take, and, and take consideration for this term ambassador as a representative of Christ. When we go forward to preach the gospel, you are representing Jesus Christ. So this is definitely an area where we don't want to get super relaxed and just super, you know, like, like treating it like it's nothing. You get so comfortable out there where you just get really uh, sloppy in your representation of Jesus Christ. Now, it's such an easy concept to understand we could look at the world, and when you look at ambassadors and you look at representatives and you see people that are going to other countries, what you will always see is the gravity and the seriousness of their representation. It's going to show in the way that they dress, in the way that they speak, in the way that they carry themselves. In all that they do, they want to have integrity. They want to be respectful. I'm not, look, I'm not saying all politicians have integrity, but this is what an ambassador should at least be putting forth that they have, right? They, they, they need to be respected. They need to be able to bring and be able to, to voice their concerns to where people are going to want to listen and hear and have respect for them. I mean, imagine how ridiculous it would be if some representative just showed up and they're in flip-flops and shorts and they're like, you know, using a bunch of slang and saying, you know, like, like, is this who you, like, is this how you want to be perceived? Is this how you want to be seen? Just completely unprofessional, completely just like, almost like a joke, like you're just on vacation or something as opposed to actually performing a serious job. And we need to remember, when we go soul winning, you are in a position as an ambassador. And you're not representing a president. You're not representing some wicked, corrupt government. You're representing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if there's ever a time to ever take a job of an ambassador seriously, it's when you're representing Jesus Christ. The way that you carry yourself when you speak to people, you are representing Christ. So think about things like, how should I speak? Should I be using filthy language and just, you know, cutting up jokes and all this other stuff when I'm giving the gospel to people? Oh, man, yeah, but you just got to reach them where they are. Oh, no, hold on, we're going to get to that later. Don't ever forget, though, you're representing Jesus Christ. I'm all for reaching people where they are, but I'm also all for maintaining standards while you do that. You don't, you don't go into a bar to reach a drunkard and then be like, hey, man, give me a beer and start, and start drinking up and boozing up with them when the Bible teaches us not to do that. You're not being a good representative of Jesus Christ. Now, look, that's a pretty extreme example, but I want you to take this thought of being an ambassador for Christ and say, how should I be carrying myself when, when I go around and talk to people? Am I going to be saying things that are really not becoming of a Christian? Am I going to be doing things that's going to cause people to be upset or angry with me, maybe even before I get a chance to talk to them? 
And these are some of the things, and, and look, it may seem like trivial or small things, but when we treat this as an important job, we ought to be paying attention to the details because we want to be a good representative. We want to be a good ambassador. And I'll tell you this much, you know, especially maybe you're new, there's a lot of thought that goes into our soul winning, into the technique, into what we do, because it's such an important task, because it's, it's, people's souls are on the line. And, and we need to do the best job that we possibly can to help people. And look, we're imperfect, right? But if we could do better, why wouldn't we? <laughs> right? And we should always be analyzing and thinking about, hey, what can I do better? Because, I mean, first of all, hopefully you care about the people you're talking to. You care about the souls. Amen. Right? You're not just being a robot and like, oh, I was commanded to do this, so I guess I'm going to do this. You ought to care about, hey, I want, I want this person to have eternal life. I don't want to see this person burn in hell. And it's so easy to be saved, so I want, I'm going to share that with them. And then when you love the person enough to share the gospel with them, say, you know what, I want, to, I, I want to at least make sure that if they reject the gospel, it's because they understand the gospel, it's because I've used the word of God. I've done everything I could to show them that this is true, this is right. Now look, it's on them if they choose not to, but what I don't want to have happen is someone reject the gospel because of something that I'm doing. Because they don't like me, because they don't like something that I've said or something that I've done coming up to them. Now look, if you're doing what's right and they still don't like you because of that, there's, that you're not at fault. Because you're doing right. But if you're doing even little things that's going to set someone off or trigger people, you, you know, we ought to be paying attention to that. And, and here's a real simple example of that. And this is something I teach all the time. When we go out and knock on doors because we're going up to someone else's house, be respectful of their property, their house, everything that at their door you're going to. Don't do things that might upset people. And the most basic concept is you know, found in Scripture where Jesus said, As ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. Right? So that's a real good principle just to say, hey, let me think about if someone came to my house, what would make me angry? What would I not like if they showed up and did X, Y, Z, right? Well, consider that when you're going to someone else's house. But what we also need to consider is maybe you wouldn't be upset by, I don't know, one thing, something in particular, but you know that other people get upset by it then you still don't do those things. And, and here's a real, a real simple example is like cutting through someone's yard. Now, personally, like I don't, I don't care that much at my house, you know, but some people really care a lot about that. And it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. We're going to try to reach people with the gospel, right? So, what you don't want to have happen is someone come to their door when they just saw you walk like right in front of their window. Maybe they feel like it's an invasion of privacy or something because you're walking like right in front of their house or whatever, whatever the reason is, right? And just have them angry with you before you could even open up your mouth. And look, it happens. That's why I'm bringing it up. And, and isn't that something that's just so simple that we could just easily say, you know what, I won't be lazy and cut corners here. I'm going to show respect. I'm going to walk in the, the, the path that looks like they have set up for walking. Walk down the driveway, walk out to the street or the sidewalk, and then go to the next house and do the same exact thing and show respect to the people that you're going to their house. Just because you see people throwing flyers on doors and they're cutting across and trying to make it as fast as possible, look, that's not what we do. And that's one sim and, and, and that's just such a, it's such a small thing. It's such a small detail, but here's the thing. We're ambassadors. We need to be paying attention to the details. Amen. And we need to be serving Christ and thinking about all these things and say, hey, how can I be the best representative, the best ambassador and going, you know, what can I do? It's worth putting forth the effort into the soul winning. 
It's an important job. Put forth the effort. Being respectful, right? So we think about um, just being respectful to people. You talk to people with respect. Being courteous. Allowing people to speak. You're not there just to preach at people and, and you know, tell them everything you want to tell them and then don't, you know, like cut them off and don't let them finish a sentence and things like that. That's not very respectful. And you're not going to reach people by doing those things. You got you to have tact and know how to talk with people. And here's the thing. We actually care about the person and we want to engage with them. Dialogue is important. We don't go out to preach the gospel to preach at people. That's what the street preachers do. They just go out and they yell at people and they hold signs and just yell at people. That's not effective. Because every individual needs to understand the gospel and in order to do that, it's going to require some level of communication, right? Because different people have different hang-ups and different things that, that either they don't understand or they've heard differently or whatever that's going to that's gonna help engage and be able to make clear, well, what does the gospel really mean? Or like, oh, people have preconceived ideas all the time. And we need to talk to understand and, be, and, and, and relate to people and say, hey, where are they coming from? What do they believe? And show them, wait, if something's an error, no, wait, no, this is why it's an error because the Bible says this right here, right? And be able to show those things. But you always have to be respectful of the people that you're talking to. Also consider this, um, you know, part of being respectful is uh, having conversations with your soul winning partners when you're out and soul winning. And look, I think it's great to talk and get to know people and fellowship and, and have that nice communion, brothers and sisters of Christ going out and preaching the gospel, also being able to have conversations. But I'll tell you what when, you what, when you show up to that door and you knock on that door or ring that doorbell, you can't just be having these loud, obnoxious conversations and laughing and joking and doing all this stuff when you're at the door. It's business time. You're an ambassador. You're representing Jesus Christ. It's not just social hour when you're at the door. Now, here's the thing. You can talk, and you can talk louder when you're out on the street, you're walking between houses or something, but when you get up to that door, you keep it very quiet. You should be... Look, this is go time. It's serious time. And, here, and here's the other thing, too. You should be focused on being able to present the gospel, not just focused on your conversation. It has nothing to do with the gospel. It's when you walk up to that door, it's time to be mentally prepared and be thinking already of what you're going to say when the person opens up the door. And I'm not saying you can't have conversations, but look, you need to do so appropriately. And if something needs to be cut, yeah, the conversation could be cut because that's not as important as the job that you're doing out preaching the gospel. It's not as important. So you need to be able to show a little bit of common sense when you're approaching someone's house because also think about from their perspective, you just got people showing up and they're just talking and jabbing and stuff and you haven't even knocked on the door. It's like, what are these people doing just walking up to my house and just talking real life? You know, it's just like, what are you doing? Now, another consideration and yet you need to keep in mind also, and, and this is, you know, I don't have a problem with this, but there's almost everybody has those ring doorbells now. And those things record. So keep your conversations appropriate anyways. It, it, it should happen whether you're being recorded or not. But we ought to be living our life as if everything that you say and do is being recorded. I mean, that's, you know, if you're going to be above reproach, that's how you have to live. But sometimes there's things you might make a comment about. And look, I've had this happen, and I've had someone contact our church, and they were right. And they said something about uh, being recorded, and so someone made some comment about their Halloween decorations or something that was up. So, well, like, like, why? They've got you, they're hearing you say this stuff, about their decorations that are up on their, on their yard, on their property, whatever, you're going to start off offending people that probably aren't even saved, right, over something so stupid that, you know what, maybe it is wrong. So what? You're not there to point out every single one of their problems and how they decorate their house or whatever. You're there to preach the gospel to them. 
So, so keep that in mind when you go out and you preach the gospel that like, look, everything needs to be appropriate and you have to have the person in mind at all times, that you're not there to offend them in something silly. Now, if they get offended at the gospel, that happens sometimes. There's nothing you can, I mean, you're, teach, you're, you're, you're telling them the truth about the word of God and about Christ dying for their sins. We're not there just trying to you know, start off before we could even get to talking about the gospel, just whatever, whatever stupid thing is that you don't like about their house or about whatever. There's no point to that. You're not, you're not starting off on the right foot. You're not being very respectful of that person. You want, you want to be able to speak and engage. And if people get upset over the content of the Bible and the way that the conversation goes with you preaching the gospel, again, that's part of the job, but at least you're representing Christ appropriately. As an ambassador, also, we need to know how to show humility. Again, we're entreating people with the gospel of Christ. Now, you can be confident, and we all should be confident in the word of God. We know that we're teaching truth. So you don't have to preach the gospel in a questioning way of like, as if what you're saying might not be true. It is true. So we're going to present it that way. But there's a difference between having the confidence in the word of God and showing someone factually from the Bible, like, hey, this is how you can be saved, versus being arrogant and cocky about what you're saying and about them and about, you know, kind of just being real judgy on them and being like, oh, yeah, well, you, you know, of course, you're not going to heaven and, you know, saying things in just a rude, disrespectful manner as opposed to, because, look, you can say things, you can show someone that they're going to go to hell in a tactful way versus being a jerk about it. There's different ways of saying things, right? And when you're trying to entreat people and show them, hey, look, you know, maybe use a little more compassion and care about the fact that, look, you're going to, you know, you're going to go to hell when you die if you don't believe this, right? This is, this is important. You got you to see this as truth. And the whole point and, and the whole spirit that we need to have is one of caring for people, and representing Christ the way that he would have you to represent him and not being ashamed. Now, as I mentioned before, because of the importance of the job being an ambassador, it's important we ought to be putting forth an effort. So part of improving our soul winning is also going to be, to be um, doing things like spending time memorizing verses, for example. Right? Getting the word of God in your heart, memorizing the verses that, are good, that, you're good, that you like to share with people so that you have those words in your heart, it's going to help you, one, to be able to better explain those verses when you've been meditating on them, you've been memorizing them, you're thinking about them. But also, in case you, you are in a position where you don't have a Bible handy on you or something like that, you could still share the Word of God because it's memorized, because you know it, because you could uh, then bring that up from memory and quote verses to people to share with them um, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, put forth your effort into knowing how you're going to present the gospel to people. It requires effort. It requires you to take the time on your own time to go through the Bible and think and study and just be like, how am I going to present this to people and put forth that effort. Always trying to improve. Again, it's more effort. It's work. This is a job. You're an ambassador. You look at past failures, you look at times where you, th where you should always be, look, to this day, I question my interactions with people in the, in the sense of, could I have done anything better? All the time, all the time. Because if you think you've just got the perfect presentation and everything you do is right, you need to humble yourself. And look, I've been soul winning for 18 years. And I am constantly looking at what I can do to improve. There's self-analysis going back in my head, replaying conversation. Could I have said this different? Could I have said that different? What could I have done different? As well as going soul winning with other people, other partners. I love doing that. And look, I encourage you to do that. And, and, and lately here, I've been allowing everyone to kind of pick their own partners and go out soul winning with whoever you want to. 
it's a great idea to start choosing other people, occasionally at least, to get to be able to learn from other people as well and hear what other people are saying and be able to incorporate. Oh, man, I really like the way they explain that. I think that's a great example or that's a great Bible verse. I never really thought about using that in my presentation. And I think that makes a lot of sense. These are all areas where we can help one another to just become better. And I've incorporated many people, like, like so many different people have had different things that they've done that I've incorporated in my soul winning to one capacity or another that has been very helpful. So it's a great idea to not just continually always go with the same person every time because then it makes it a little bit harder to grow when you're not experiencing, you know, just going out with other people. Hey, it's, it's, a, it's a good opportunity. Also, as you're, as you're putting forth this effort into being an ambassador and being a good soul winner, learn how to support the vital doctrines. Okay, there's going to be some things that come up regularly, periodically, just, just pretty normally at the door when you're talking to people. And if you don't know how to answer those questions, make a note of those things, write it down, and then study it out later so that the net, you know, you might not be able, you're not going to be able to answer everyone's questions all the time. But if there's something that you don't know, if there's something that you get stumped on or something you're not quite sure how to answer, write it down so you can study it out later so that the next time someone asks that question, you can answer that question for them. But it requires effort. Make the notes. And, you know, before I had a much better memory on where things were in Scripture, in the back of my Bible, and, and, and you know, you can do the same exact thing or do whatever's going to work for you, but the point is, put forth the effort. In the back of the Bible, you always have these blank pages. So what I did when I was still trying to remember where everything was, as a, as a newer a uh, younger believer, I would write down like, I would put JW here and then I would have all these verses that I would use if I talked to a JW or a Mormon or a Pentecostal or uh, I would write a topic like hell. I would write a topic about eternal security, you know, all these different things. I would have little categories of stuff. So if that, if that came up, I need to explain it more than I had verses that I could turn to. And there's nothing wrong with having those aids with you to help you out and just be like, oh, yeah. But, you know, what? over time, the goal is to not even have to rely on that, right? You know the Bible well enough to be able to just turn to wherever you need to to explain all these basic truths, right? Now, now obviously, like, like I've grown in over the years to handle all of the common stuff, but it's not like I could just necessarily answer every single question that ever might possibly come up. I, I, you know, I wish I had that mastery of the Bible to be able to just answer anything, okay? But I don't, but, but you know what? That's what we're striving for, right? I want to be the best ambassador I could be. Answer as many questions as possible, be able to, 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 to give a reason for the hope that's in us, right? And be able to uh, show people that and be very effective at showing them the truth. So. Learn, study, know how to defend these things yourself. Learn how you can prove eternal security, how you can prove the deity of Christ, how you can prove that hell is a real place, how you can, you know, all these things need to be proven to people. You need to show it to them. You need to explain and expound and be like, this is what the Bible teaches and here's the evidence for that. Because we never expect people to believe you just because you say it. That's why we bring our Bibles with you. And by the way, bring your Bible with you. And this is, look, I just mentioned about memorizing verses and being able to use them, but have your Bible with you. And there is a lot of power to showing people's passages in the, in the scripture. I don't always turn to every single passage in the Bible when I'm preaching the gospel to people because I have them memorized. However, even though I have all of the verses that I use memorized, it's rare when I will only ever just quote the scripture and not open up the Bible and show people. And the reason being is because you're showing people what the Bible says. And then it's clear, look, see what the Bible says right here? That's the word of God. Obviously, you can quote the word of God to people. You can do that. But it's... Uh, you're going to be showing them something. I think it's a little more powerful to be able for them to see it for themselves. It's, a, it's, it's going to add just a little bit more of them being able to 
see it and be like, oh yeah, that is what the Bible says and it's right there and you, you're bringing the Bible to them. So, uh, you know, all of these things are, are important. Now, I'm going to shift gears just a little bit here to something that, that I'm, I'm happy has come up a lot recently and has to do with sharing the gospel in other languages. And, I, and I'm, I'm glad that there's, a, there's actually a lot of people in our church that are really interested in being able to do this and being able to share the gospel, especially because we run across so many Spanish-speaking people in our area here, in Gwinnett County and specifically in Norcross in our area. There's a lot of Hispanics, a lot of people who only speak Spanish, right? And we have a heart and desire to reach those people. And, and that's awesome. But I want to give a little guidance when it comes to those who don't speak the language that want to reach these people with their language, okay? And this is just a little instruction and a little bit of guidance on what to do because there's been various people have come up with their own um, plans of like, I can say this and I can see th say this. I know Brother Devin has something, Brother Preston has something. You know, different people have different, and look, I use the same thing when I was out soul winning with helps and guides and things in Spanish and, and things you can say but I, I want to make sure we're very careful with this. One, because it could be, you know, people who don't know a language can end up ultimately just kind of wasting their time. If you can't understand what people are saying to you, don't engage them in a conversation. There's not enough things you can write down in another language when it comes to presenting the gospel. Now, if, if, if you wanted to go to a restaurant <laughs> or some other public area and you're going to another country and you write down some things that you can say to try to, to, to get somewhere or order something, yeah, great, of course, do that. But when we're preaching the gospel, there's more to preaching the gospel than just reading a verse. Right? I mean, you know English. Do you ever just go so and just be like, I'm just going to read this verse, this verse, this verse, this verse, this verse, and then like maybe have them repeat a prayer and then walk away and be like, yeah, they got saved. Never. You never do that. You never do that. You have to gauge a conversation. You have to talk to people. You have to see where they're coming from. See, what do they actually believe? Do you believe this or not? You have to have communication with people to know where they're at. Amen. Now, it doesn't mean you can't share a verse with someone. Great, share a verse with someone. You could read a verse in Spanish and share that with them. Maybe learn what to say to give a little explanation for that. But if you don't know the language, you're just going to be spinning your wheels and wasting your time doing too much of that. Now, learn the language. Study the language. And the more you learn, the more you'll be able to do and be effective at the door. Okay? But if you just can't understand anything that people are saying to you, don't waste your time trying to go really far with a gospel presentation in that language. It, it, just, it just doesn't make sense. So if you're an extreme new beginner and you don't really know anything about the language, here's something that you can learn that will be helpful. And that's going to be to only speak what you know and maybe learn how to direct people to a video. We have the cards Learn the sentence or two that can say, I don't know very much Spanish, or I don't, you know. But here's a video explaining how to be saved. Please watch this when you have time. And maybe you can say a verse, or learn John 3.16 or something, and leave them with that. And there's a balance we have to strike between, obviously, our desire and our, you know, we want to get people saved, and oftentimes, when you're speaking a foreign language, people will tend to listen to you more so you can get their attention. But we want to make the best use of our time also so that you're not just, you're not just an audio Bible, right? Because soul winning is not being an audio Bible. Soul winning is communicating and explaining and talking about things. So if you can't do that, then just save your time Say, hey, here's someone that, that can say these things way better than I can, <laughs> right? Here's someone who's very experienced, and they're going to be able to give the explanation, do all this stuff, and it's recorded, and they can listen to that. Leave that with them, and then continue on, because, you know, hopefully you'll run into someone whose language you can speak, and then you have more time to spend with them instead of trying to just 
you know, follow a script. I'm not saying all scripts are bad, but if you're just reading a script, that's, that's not really how we go soul winning. There's an order, there's verses, we want to present things logically to people, but it's never just a script. Don't go soul winning by just, you just say this, 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 this. Like a, like a, a new salesman that's trying to learn how to sell and be like, okay, customer says this, I need to say this. And, you know, let me get my manager for you and let me, <laughs> whatever, right? Effective soul winning requires conversations, requires dialogue, requires you to engage with people. So if you can't do that in the language, recognize that for yourself, learn, study, right? Do, do everything you can to try to be able to do more. And here's the thing, as much as you can do, I was talking to Brother Devin before a service about this. And, um, you know, he made a really great point, which I, I believe wholeheartedly. When he tries to give the gospel in Spanish, he only will go as far as to where he could understand what the person is saying. And as soon as you can't really understand what they're saying, you know what, that's a good time to say, okay, well, I don't really know that much Spanish. So here you can, you can watch this and, and then move on, right? So I'm not saying don't try, but, but give, spend the amount of time as is appropriate for your knowledge and understanding of the language you're trying to show people. And if you know nothing, just direct them to the video, right? And like I said, maybe share a verse with them or something, but, but move on. And then put forth the effort and learn more so that you can communicate better with people. And then the more advanced you get in your understanding of a language, obviously then spend more time. And like now, if I don't understand something someone says, I could communicate enough to say, hey, I don't understand exactly what you said. Can you say it a little bit different? Right? And, and ask for some explanation because I've, I've, I've grown in, to be able to understand more than that, right? But still, even then, if there's a point where I'm still just not getting what they're saying, I'm done. I, I don't really understand. Well, okay, thanks for your time. So, great. Continue to pursue foreign languages, right? But let's do so in a way that just makes sense, right? We're not just spinning our wheels at the door because our time is limited, Right? Um, another thing you can learn how to ask is, does anyone here speak English? Yeah. And I'm serious about that. Like, that's, it's such a simple thing, but think to ask that first. Because if someone speaks English, and especially they, they could then translate, help translate for you, you could still communicate and find someone there that can, hey, let me talk to them. I could give them the gospel in English, and then maybe they can help communicate also in Spanish or whatever the language, right? So, so learn how to ask for that. In addition to learning how to show people, hey, here's how you watch this video, please, right? Um, let's continue on here. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 2. Now, all of these are very general principles and general things to help us improve our soul winning, but there's also some, some topics in some areas where I think specifically Stronghold Baptist Church needs to improve our soul winning. Okay? And obviously the language thing is something that's come up more recently, so I want to give guidance and direction on that because it's a great thing for a lot of people to want to do that. And, and I encourage that. And, I, and I'm not trying to throw a wet blanket on it either. Like, like learn the languages and learn how to communicate with people. Absolutely. But let's just do so wisely so we're not wasting our time. Similarly to in English, you're speaking to someone, you don't want to waste your time, you know, debating a heretic, right? Just, just, right. hey, one or two verses, right? You, you admonish them, you give them the Bible. If they're not going to receive it and they're not going to hear it, then just move on, right? We don't want to waste our time just arguing and arguing and arguing. Fine. Another day maybe, right? And, and, and move on. Well, I treat the language kind of similarly and say, okay, well, I don't really know that much about this, so I'm going to... Here's a little bit, here's a little something, but thank you until you could learn and do better, right? Um, but another area here, and we're in, you're in Acts chapter 2, the Bible reads in verse number 17, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants... And on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. 
And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Verse 21, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, this is the day of Pentecost and this is when people were preaching the gospel. The disciples were preaching the gospel to the people who were in attendance there. God gave them the ability to speak with other languages, to communicate with all these other people that were there. But the prophecy from Joel that's being quoted here and saying, hey, look, this is happening right now, was in regards to them preaching the gospel and then whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But he says that God's going to pour out his spirit on your sons and your daughters, on the servants and my handmaidens. It's men and women alike. And what we're lopsided on in this church is the proportion of men that go soul winning to women. Amen. Men that give the gospel versus women that give the gospel. And look, it is all of our duties as believers to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Women get saved the same as men get saved. Call on the name of the Lord. Put your faith in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Women are sinners just as much as men are sinners. We need Christ the same. Well, you know what? We also need to give the gospel the same. Now, there are some differences in regards to families and having children and some of the things that might prevent the amount of time or how you go soul winning. Understood. Understood. But that should not prevent soul winning altogether. Amen. It can always be done. And look, I'm an example. I'll lead by example. And I was talking to Leslie about what I was preaching today. She was like, well, yeah, you took me out soul winning. And, and I'll say this. I believe that husbands ought to train their wives. If your wife doesn't know how to go soul winning and preach the gospel, it's your job, husband, to teach your wife how to go soul winning. Amen. It's your job. It's your duty. You are the spiritual leader in the house. You ought to be doing that. And, you know, there's gender roles are taught all throughout Scripture, the husband being ahead of the house. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and stay in Acts, stay in Acts if you would. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it talks a lot about speaking in tongues, how things ought to be done in the house of God decently and in order. But it also says this in verse 34, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, I'm not talking about speaking in the church this morning, but, the, but what we see, the principle going forward here is, look, if, if, if the wife has a question, ask your husband at home. Amen. Why? Because your husband's the one that's going to teach you. He's, that's his job. He's supposed to be not just the, the provider, the financial leader of the house, but he's also the spiritual leader of the house. That's been, that is a duty that God has given to husbands to be the head of the wife in all things. Amen. So also spiritually, you need to be the spiritual head of the house. And, and at the end of the day, yes, wives... Mothers have a lot of responsibility for rearing children and guiding the house and doing all these things. But you know what? There's an authority above that who's ultimately responsible for all of it. And that's the husband. Amen. So if things aren't being done appropriately at home, husband, it's your job to make sure that they are. And that's, that's your duty. And if, if you know, you're a soul winner and you spend all this time, and, but your wife doesn't know how to go soul, you need to teach her. Amen. You need to be able to help Present the bride, present your wife spotless, as Ephesians 5 talks about, blameless, right? Uh, all of these things, like, like Christ wants to, to, to help the church and get the church into, be, into a position of you know, getting rid of sins and, and being able to be presented spotless and blameless before him. Well, that's also the duty of the husband with the wife. And you could read Ephesians 5 further for more information about that if you want that proven to you. But... We need to be, uh, especially the ladies, understand, one, it's your job. We see in Acts chapter 2, it's your job. We see in Acts 21, verse 8. I'll read this for you. Turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Acts 21, 8, the Bible says, In the day, in the next day, we, were, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist. An evangelist is someone who preaches the gospel which was one of the seven, and abode with him. 
He was one of the, this is Philip that was one of the seven men that were chosen to take care of the, the widows and other things. He was a man of good report, but he was an evangelist. It says, and the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. He taught his, his daughters to preach the gospel. We saw in Acts chapter 2 that, that it wasn't just the sons, it was also the daughters. It wasn't just the servants, it was the handmaidens that were also, God poured his spirit out on them. God can work through male and female because you're in Christ. doesn't matter. And it's a spiritual thing that we're doing preaching the gospel. It's not a carnal thing. So some of the differences between men and women have more to do with, with just living your life carnally with, with different responsibilities. But when it comes to preaching the gospel, look, that's a spiritual thing. We all are subject to God. So even though the wife may be subject to her husband, the husband is subject to Christ in Christ to the Father, but that order of, of authority, the top reigns supreme. So if anyone underneath that top authority is doing things or commanding things outside of the scope and, and in contradiction to the greater authority, then you're not bound to that immediate higher authority. You're bound by the ultimate authority. And it's, what, what I'm saying here is it's similar to, to you know, even our human government. We've got a constitution of the whole United States of America, and then you've got individual states. Now, a law, every state has their own laws and stuff, but there's this one big overarching rule of law that can't be contradicted, right? The people say that's unconstitutional. So states can't pass laws because there's a gr that would contradict the greater authority of the Constitution of the United States. So similarly, right, that we understand that to kind of make sense. Well, within a family, if a husband is commanding his wife to do something, but it's, it's in contradiction to what God says, then the wife is not bound to obey her husband in that, in that area where that's, that is not lawful. That's not what, what is right. It's not what God says. So, because everyone individually is responsible to God. Right. We're all responsible for our own actions. We all, uh, whatever our sins are, we have our own responsibility to God. Look at verse number 16 in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The Bible reads, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. It's like, I need to do this, right? It's a necessity. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. So speaking about the duty of giving the gospel to people and preaching the gospel, he's saying, look, this isn't just like well, if I feel like doing it, then I'll do it. And if I don't, then I won't. This is, this is necessity. Like God has laid this burden on me. I'm an ambassador. This is my job. I need to do this. And in fact, woe unto me if I don't do this. If I don't take up this job, if I don't preach the gospel the way I ought to. Look, he's entrusted us with his word. He's given us this ministry. He's given us this job. We need to do this. And woe unto me if I don't do it. Verse 17 says, for if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. It's like, hey, God will reward you. God will bless you. God will, God will, you'll receive or earn rewards at the judgment of Christ when you go forth and you serve him and you're doing good and you're bringing forth good fruit. God rewards you for that. Amen. So amen, that's great. So if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, hey, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. He's saying, but, but if, even if I don't want to, it's still been committed unto me. This job is still mine to do. Amen. Hey, if I go forth and do this willingly, great, I'm going to get rewarded. But even if I don't want to, it's still my job. Amen. It's still my job. And that's male and female. This isn't just unique to the Apostle Paul. This is every believer has this obligation to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you think about it, you know, there's so many ways to, under, to, to, to look at this. You're saved from hell. I mean, just think about how awesome that is anyways. Yeah. What great news it is that God saved you. Amen. Can you at least show some compassion, some love for other people that you'd be willing to say, you know what, I'm going to try to show the same exact thing that I've received the, the, the good news, the awesome news that I'm saved and, and share that with somebody else so that they could have the same thing that I have. Amen. It's not like you have to hoard the gospel to yourself. Like, I got eternal life. You can't have any. No, it's available to everybody. 
It's not, it's not limited eternal life. It's, <laughs> it's infinite eternal life, right? Amen. It's there for all. The whole world. Christ paid for everyone's sins. It's not like Christ, I only died for 100 million people's sins, and then after that, it's, it's done. We've reached the limit. Like, no. All sins. All people. So let's share that with people. Let's love people enough to do that. A few more points. And I'll wrap this up. Um, improving, our, improving our soul winning. Okay, so... so you know, I encourage ladies and, and, you know, families especially, work out a way for this to happen. And, you know, the bigger our family's gotten, sometimes the harder it is to, to have everyone go, especially when you have real little ones and little babies and stuff. But you know what? Husbands, work it out with your wives to be able to go soul winning sometimes. Amen. And even if it's not as often as you go, work it out. I mean, there's times where I'll hang back so that Leslie can go and, and do soul winning on a date. Like, hey, I haven't, you know, and Alan Gertrude will say, hey, look, you haven't gone soul very much in a while. Why don't you go? And, and, and you know, we, we could take turns. But you know what else you could do? You could also bring the whole family with you. And we do that sometimes too. And again, everyone's situation might be a little bit different. Some things depend more on the weather. you got a brand new baby. You're not going to bring a brand new baby out in like freezing, ice, sleet, rain, or whatever. You know, like, like you're going to be considerate of the health of, of, of your whole family. But... There's plenty of still of opportunities to be able to make things work. There's always a way to make it work. There's always a way. Always. But it has to be important enough to you to make it work. Improving our soul winning. Transitioning to being a talker. If you've been going out and being a silent partner for a long time, you need to think about transitioning to speaking. Okay. And I'll encourage you with this. It gets easier, a lot easier, once you actually start talking. So you have to have the courage or the boldness to be able to open up your mouth, okay? But once you get over that hurdle, once you do it even the first time, it only gets easier. It might be slightly easier at first, but after a few times of, of putting yourself out there, opening up your mouth saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to try to share the gospel with someone, it will get increasingly easier over time. And we've, well, I don't know if we've all been there. I've been there as someone who is super shy, never, you know, never wanted people to even open the door. I would go soul winning because I knew I had to. Necessity was laid upon me. I saw it from scripture. Personally, I saw that. I, I went to church, it was preached. And I saw that and I was like, well, hey, I have to go. No doubt about it. Like, I have to go. I have to do this. So I want to be right with God, so I'm going to go soul winning. But then you go out there and it's like, I didn't really want to talk to people because, why? Because I was scared. I was scared. It's kind of embarrassing to say that. I was scared. But you know what? He did it anyways. And then after a while, you realize, why was I scared? Seriously, like there was no reason for it. It's, it's irrational, okay? It's irrational. But don't feel like if, if you have anxiety, if you're scared, if you don't know what to say, if you're, if you're nervous, we've been there. And just let me be proof to you that God will use you. You have to yield yourself to him though and you have to be able to take the step and, and take the step on faith that even though you may not be a good speaker, even though you may not feel that comfortable, even though you might not think you're that good at giving the gospel or something, that God will still use you. And here's the other point to that too. Again, drawing from my own experience, it took me, I don't know how long, months and months and months and months and months and months of being a silent partner before I would say anything. And, and here's what happened in my experience. I, was, I learned soul winning directly from Pastor Anderson. And here I am, an immature young Christian, not knowing a whole lot, going with the pastor of a church that has immense knowledge and wisdom from the Bible. And has been going out soul winning for a super long time, really good at it, knows how to speak to people, knows how to handle every situation. And here am I going, man, I don't even know what I would say for some of these, you know, like, like I'm just kind of blown away. I'm just thinking like, wow, this is awesome. And I was learning and I was listening and everything. But every time we'd go to the door, I would just think like, 
I don't want to screw this up for that person. I want him to give the gospel because he's better at it than I am. This is my thought process. But look, it's a faulty thought process. And, and hear me out. It wasn't until I actually went with someone from a whole different church that didn't do soul winning the same way that we do, where I actually got the courage to say, oh, wait, I could do this. Because now I'm with someone who wasn't Pastor Anderson, that, that, that wasn't doing as good of a job and not explain, you know, not, not even really getting into the gospel. They're kind of more just inviting people to church. So that's where I drew the courage to be able to say, well, hey, look, I think I could do this. And you know what? I was able to do it. And was I perfect at it? No, I wasn't perfect at it. No, of course. Like I stumbled around and fumbled a little bit. But after that, then the next time I went out swimming past race, and then I was able to start talking again. Like as soon as you open up your mouth, it just gets a little bit easier. But here's what you have to understand too, is what if, I mean, here I am today pastoring a church in Georgia. And we have a great amount of people here that are also soul-winning and serving God and doing everything here. What if I just never opened up my mouth to be a soul winner? If I just stayed a silent partner the whole time? Well, none of this would happen at all. There's no way I'd be an ordained pastor of a church if I can't even open up my mouth and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? But it all has to start from somewhere, right? And the learning and the growth and everything. And here's the thing. Now, how many more people... Instead of just leaving one man to do all the work and say, well, he's better at it than I am. Well, you know what? You just need to get better then. Yeah. 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 And just put yourself out there because, you know what? You're going to get a lot more accomplished with two people that could preach the gospel than one. Right. Yeah. And if, let's say we have 20 people that could preach the gospel here. Well, we're going to do a lot more work if we have 40 people that could preach the gospel here. Yeah. And as we grow, look, you silent partners, you need to start speaking so that your partner can now go soul with someone else who's new, who doesn't know and has never been soul before. And then ultimately you'll be able to take people with you and show them the ropes too. And that's how we grow. And that's how things get done. And, and you need to just be able to, you know, overcome whatever it is in your mind that's preventing you from trying to give the gospel and just do it. And look, we don't make it any easier for you because at any point, if you have any trouble with preaching the gospel, just turn to your partner and ask him for help and let them finish. But, but start talking. You'll, you'll grow that much faster. And you know, in, in retrospect, I wish I had started earlier because I could have done what I had done. You know, in, instead of waiting six months, I could have waited maybe one month or something. You know what I mean? Like, like if I would have just got, because the growth happens so much faster once you get started doing it. Amen. The learning by the experience is, is way better than just learning by hearing. Amen. Doing, do it, and, and, let your, and let your partner guide you too. And if there's anything that they can help you, ask your partner, get done preaching gospel. Hey, what can I have said? Can I have done anything different? That's what they're there for. Now, I have this written down to improve our soul winning here. Be diligent with your maps, please. We're, we're trying to do everything decently in order. We, we got a big plan. We're trying to do everything to make sure we're reaching everybody so we're keeping track of what we do. Okay, be considerate of people who might go back to a place after you've done it. Be really clear about what's done, what's not done. Write notes, write down, this building's done, these doors aren't done. If you're facing the building this way, it's a left stairwell, not the right stairwell, whatever. Like as much, just give the information so that way we can be diligent in making sure we talk to everybody because we're trying to reach everybody. Okay, so that's, that's another thing. We just, just treat it as being important. We could, you know, and we don't want to necessarily, you know, sometimes we choose to go back to, to the same areas more than once. But we want to at least know, hey, look, we've been here. We've got this all done so we can target other areas because, again, the goal is to try to reach everybody in our area. That's one of the main goals. And then finally, um, pay attention to people's body language. And as a newer soul owner, you just start talking. You're probably more focused on what you need to say. And I get it, right? This is something that's going to come over time and it's going to help you improve once you get past the point of having to really focus on what passage should I turn to next and what do I have to say, you know, like, like you get past, you kind of grow through that phase of being able to comfortably present the gospel, 
in a way that you're real just confident of, okay, I need to show them we're a sinner, I'm going to show them the penalties for sin, I'm going to show them what Christ did for us, explain who Christ is, what they have to do to be saved, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're saved forever, it's eternal, you know, I know how to do that, I'm, I, I've got that down, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Now start paying more attention to the people you're talking to and try to discern whether or not they're even interested in what you're saying. Because again, the, just like the, you know, foreign language or just like debating a heretic, you could be wasting your time if people aren't really interested in what you're saying. If you notice people spacing off and not paying attention to everything else, it's okay to say, I, I'm sorry, like, are you, are you paying attention? Do you want to hear this? Right? And you have to be rude about it. Even if they're being rude, Maybe they're being disrespectful and they're doing things that's just like, come on, man, do you want me to be here or not? But you can ask them politely and say, I'm sorry, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to waste your time. If you don't really want to hear this, I could go. I don't, I don't have to do this right now. Right? Because we don't want to waste our time either. So if someone's just going to be polite enough to not tell you to leave, it's still not going to do any good. So not, they're not hearing you. They don't really care. Okay? Just look at people's demeanor. And, and sometimes we read wrong, which is why you ask a question. And if they say, no, no, I'm, you know, like some people just, they've got ADD or something and they're, you know, but, they're, but they are listening and they want to hear. So you ask the question, don't assume, just ask them, say, hey, do you want me to, you know, do you want to hear this? Do you want me to come back? Is it, you know, something, whatever. And then deal with that and, and learn to know when people just really don't want to talk to you. And don't be the person that has to like shove your foot in the door and make them hear you. Because again, that's a waste of time. If they don't want to hear you, then move on. Someone will want to hear you. Amen. There are people out there that want to hear the gospel. Believe it or not. <laughs> They're there. And that's who we're looking for. We're not trying to cram anything down anyone's throat. We're not trying to force people into it and force people to pray. And for, you know, like, don't be so aggressive. Because everything has a balance and if you think that but if I just do this and this and this I could get them to pray and you know like it, the goal isn't to get them to pray the goal is to get them to believe and to receive Christ do we pray with people yeah we do but it has to be in their heart they have to want to do it otherwise it's pointless leading people through some steps and having them pray a prayer that's not salvation they have to put their faith in Christ. It's an internal thing. Obviously, we can't see that perfectly, but, but that's the goal. Amen. So when people aren't interested, they don't want to have anything to do with it, they don't really care about what you have to say, then they're not going to change their heart. They're not going to change, they're not, they're not going to trust Jesus when they don't even want to hear about him. So move on. Right? And... and Occasionally, you have people who change their minds kind of if you get talking to them a little bit, right? So some people might be a little hesitant to hear the gospel at first. And if you could just say a little bit, get a verse out there and be like, hey, look, sometimes people say that, you know, you're going to hell because you don't go to church. You don't do this. So that's not what the Bible says. And sometimes that's enough for people to say like, oh, really? Okay, I'll hear more because they just think they know what you're going to say. But again, discerning, is this person really interested or not? Because when they're not interested, move on. We want to maximize our time and reach people, dialogue, communicate, interact, have a discussion, talk, hear what they believe. No matter how wrong it is, hear what they have to say, so then you can show them, no, but look, this is what the Bible says. This is true, right? This is... This is where, this is what you need to understand. Here's what the Bible says and get them to, to grasp that. All right, I've gone a little bit over time this morning, but this is super important. You know, I care about, this is the, the lifeblood of our church. We want to reach people with the gospel. Amen. Treat the job importantly. Amen. We're ambassadors for Christ. Le leave with that thought in your mind. Every time we go out and preach the gospel, you're an ambassador. You're representing Jesus Christ. How are you conducting yourself? How do you present yourself at the door? How do you speak? How do you communicate with people? All these things. You're representing Jesus Christ. And that's what we do. Right? And you know what? You're representing your church, too. Obviously, Jesus Christ is more important, but you're representing Strong Old Baptist Church. That's right. When we go out and we speak. So let's...
Let's be above reproach. Let's not let our flesh take over and get involved in, in you know, arguments and yelling and, you know, and all this stuff that just... And, and I've been there. And, you know, sometimes there's really wicked people that need to be rebuked. But we're still not out to make a scene. Right? You rebuke someone and move on. And don't, don't get wrapped up into any carnal behavior. Let's bow our heads, I have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for um, entrusting us with the gospel. It's such a great honor that you've given us this duty to, uh, to preach your word. I pray that you would please help us to be that are vessels that are meet for the master's use, that we can be um, going forth and, and bearing that precious seed and that, and that you would help us to become better, more fruitful servants, dear Lord, and, and guide us. And uh, Lord, help those that, that maybe have anxieties or fears and, and have uncertainties to overcome uh, those, those internal things, uh, to be able to just share the gospel and to preach your word. And God, help us to, uh, to get more laborers because the, the harvest truly is white unto harvest. And, um, but the laborers are few. I pray that you would please just add to our church and help us to, to reach as many people as we possibly can with the good news uh, about eternal life. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.